Just so you know, this show is about scary stuff. So don't say I didn't warn you guys. And remember, don't be scared. Episode 62 Executed War Baby here with another episode of Murderous Minors. There are basically two kinds of kids we cover on the show. Those whose circumstances and appearance of a trouble-free life makes us scratch our heads and wonder how and why they found themselves in the position to kill, and those whose involvement in such crimes could theoretically result in someone winning a bet. This week on Murderous Minors, we'll cover a case set in 1990s Texas, committed by a clean-cut juvenile with his sights set on carjacking. This murder took place before the landmark U.S. Supreme Court decision in Roper v. Simmons, which made juveniles ineligible for the death penalty in 2005. The case is terrifying, and it seems counterintuitive that this is the case that took death row off the table for kids, but it did. These cases traverse the legal system in different states, but simultaneously, resulting in vastly different outcomes. In 1994 Grapeland, Texas, home of the Peanut Festival, the Beasley family enjoyed a guarded yet comfortable life in the section of town called the Quarters. They were known to break barriers. The integration of schools back in 1968 saw Rena become Grapeland High School's first black cheerleader. This was just a bit before she became an official Beasley, but she had already met her future husband, Ireland, when they were young teens not yet old enough to drive. Once they had a family, they worked tirelessly to provide their children with more comfortable childhoods than they'd enjoyed. Ireland was a steel mill line supervisor and became the first black city councilman in Grapeland. Rena worked in retail during the kids' early years before becoming the first black teller at Grapeland State Bank. She would later work as secretary to the district court judges in nearby Crockett, Texas. The couple had three children and by 1994, their oldest had already completed her college education at Rice University. There were two boys still at home, the youngest just nine and middle child, 17-year-old Napoleon. The teen was well-known throughout Grapeland, thoughtfully remembered as having exemplary manners and being an engaged student. He was class president, captain of the football team, played baseball, and ran track in their respective seasons. He was the friend who could diffuse a situation, the friend who everyone's parents adored, be they black or white. Grapeland is a small East Texas town filled with farmland and hills for as far as the eyes can see. The Beasley home sat squarely next to St. John's Baptist Church, far removed from the toughest areas like where Rena grew up. This family was damn near esteemed here, though we know that sometimes such regard can bring disdain from one's peers. And this conflict, this push-and-pull type existence, is fundamentally what Napoleon said propelled him toward his senseless random crime. But on the other, some would say opposing side of town, Napoleon's classmates and teammates with whom he had grown up resided. Though they differed, his friends accepted him unconditionally, appreciating him for all the ways they were the same. He didn't get that back in the quarters. He was too soft for them, too ambitious, too motivated, too successful, too white, some told him. And Napoleon felt this rift, lived it daily, and didn't like it. He wanted to be accepted by his black peers to be taken seriously as someone not to mess with, who could hold his own. So when his older cousin had come back to town after graduating high school and moving to Houston, Napoleon was intrigued by the way the neighborhood embraced his visits. 
He'd become a crack dealer, and he made it his mission to indoctrinate Napoleon into the life at the tender age of 13. He didn't sling much, and he didn't sling for money. He did it for respect. When Napoleon saw how his cousin was respected in the quarters, he wanted that for himself, instead of the taunts of a white boy that usually came his way. So in middle school, he secretly began selling small amounts of crack cocaine. As he jogged the streets at night for physical fitness, his jaunt served a frightening dual purpose. At school, he excelled, making honors and intending on one day applying to law school. He wasn't trying to become a drug tycoon, and he dealt so little that rumors hardly reached his parents' ears. But there were two instances when a friend had raised a red flag. Rena and Ireland had him tested both times, getting a negative result with each. What a relief. What Napoleon craved was that second of acceptance he felt when he was exchanging drugs for money. That momentary twinge that said you're doing what you're supposed to do. He knew it wasn't true, but at the same time, nothing else felt sincere to the child. He didn't have an identity. Texas Monthly Magazine ran the article, Does Napoleon Beasley Deserve to Die?, in their April 2002 issue, and he wrote journalist Pamela Koloff from prison saying, I felt more racism from blacks than I could ever experience from whites. Because some of my friends were white, I was ridiculed. Because I dated white girls, I was ridiculed. Not by white people, black people. I wanted to be accepted, so I did what I thought was necessary to fit in. I was quite frankly a chameleon, an actor. I played roles and changed colors to fit the scene and the script. I wanted to be black. When my cousin came home, he was accepted, admired, respected. No one questioned his blackness. When I dealt crack, I was accepted by the blacks everyone considered hip. Sad but true, he said. As high school rolled on, things began to change around Napoleon. His grades were still excellent, his athletics career still on track to help him pay for college. But he was still selling drugs, and it was no longer just through his cousin. While in the darkest parts of town, Napoleon would grow close to football team make Cedric Coleman an edgier, harder version of himself. As second string running back to Cedric's starting position, he was two years older, although only one year ahead of Napoleon in school. The pair were hanging out more and more during Napoleon's junior year, often with Cedric's temperamental younger brother Donald, who went by the nickname Fig. Their family was rougher, coming up in a more violent and aggressive environment, the kind Napoleon's parents strived to keep their kids away from. But it found them, or Napoleon found it, and even he couldn't stray from the wayward path and plant both feet firmly on the straight and narrow. Senior year arrived and Napoleon's school friends and teammates could see that he was living in two different worlds. Cedric had gone off to college and Napoleon's summer fling had resulted in an unplanned pregnancy. Just like that, all of his prior aspirations fizzled. Following his dreams of college ball and Stanford Law seemed frivolous and irresponsible now. As a father, he would need to be able to provide a foundation to his child's life that needed to start soon. So his year was instead devoted to joining the Marine Corps and preparing to serve. Cedric had gotten injured playing ball at Navarro College in Corsicana, made recently famous in the Netflix documentary Cheer and he returned to Grapelin and to his friendship with Napoleon in the fall of 1993. The spring of 1994 came around, and the baby Napoleon had been rearranging his life for was born, clearly fathered by someone else. Now, to add to the disappointment and regret of youthful choices, he had anger. Both he and Cedric had lost their professional athletic dreams, and each found the companion for their torment in the other. Napoleon only attended a half day of school his final year due to his participation in a work-study program, so by midday he'd be home and Cedric wouldn't be far behind. It had been Cedric Coleman's idea to carjack a Mercedes, as he had heard a fellow dealer had recently done, 
It was presented as sort of a dare, but Napoleon was all in, even telling a classmate that he may see him roll up to school in a Mercedes soon. Around 5 p.m. on April 19, 1994, the three set out in Napoleon's mother's Ford Probe, all armed. Cedric had his handgun, Napoleon had his pistol, and he had brought along a shotgun for Fig. Napoleon drove them to Corsicana, stopping in a Walmart parking lot there where they spotted Alexis. Here, Napoleon and Cedric switched places and Cedric began to tail the car. They ended up over 70 miles away in Tyler, Texas before losing the Lexus, but they finally spotted a Mercedes-Benz. As Napoleon exited the passenger side of his mother's car holding his Haskell 45 pistol, the driver ran into the restaurant and the trio decided they'd better head for home. It was a school night after all. But then, they figured they'd give it one more shot before they left Tyler. It was 11 p.m. when they spotted John Ludig, 63, driving his wife Bobby home from her religious classes in Dallas, so she didn't have to drive that late at night or make the drive alone. The boys began to tail them, following them closely through their neighborhood and right up to their home. Cedric stopped at the edge of the Ludig's fairly long driveway, and as soon as the couple pulled into their garage, Napoleon was already approaching the driver's side with his pistol ready. Fig was just behind him, armed with Napoleon's shotgun, while Cedric remained in Rena Beasley's Ford Probe at the end of the driveway. John and Bobby Ludig were prominent citizens of Tyler, Texas, located halfway between Dallas and Shreveport, Louisiana, and known as the Rose Capital of America. John was a successful businessman with ties to the oil industry, and the pair were active in their Presbyterian church. The couple opened their doors and got out as Napoleon ran up on the Mercedes and shot at John Ludig, grazing his head and bringing him to his knees in the driveway. The next shot fired was aimed at Bobby Ludig. It missed, but she pretended she had been struck, collapsing down to the garage floor and feigned incapacitation. She then watched in shock as her husband was murdered. Napoleon swiftly returned to John Ludig, walking through his blood to shoot him point-blank in the head, before rifling around on his person to locate the keys to the Mercedes. With the Coleman brothers following him in his mother's car, Napoleon hit the retaining wall, causing enough damage that he would simply abandon it a few blocks away. What the trio couldn't have known was that they had just ambushed the parents of a federal judge, rumored to be a future potential Supreme Court justice candidate. J. Michael Ludig was a federal appeals court judge, and prior to his Fourth Circuit appointment, Judge Ludig had been President George H.W. Bush's Deputy Attorney General, assisting in the confirmation of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas in 1991. Once the Ludig's car had been wrecked and abandoned, Napoleon joined Cedric and Fig in his mom's car. What was said during that car ride ultimately helped convict Napoleon, although years later both Coleman brothers would recant, saying they fabricated the stories to protect themselves from death penalty prosecution. Fig would testify that as the pair approached the Ludig's garage that night, Napoleon told him to, quote, shoot the bitch, referring to Bobby Ludig. The brothers would claim that they were scared of the teen and that they were forced to go along against their will and better judgment. Fig Pullman also testified under oath that Napoleon had spoken about the desire to hurt someone or watch somebody die. But in future sworn affidavits, both would say this wasn't true. Prosecutors steadfastly denied ever making a deal with the brothers. What they said really happened following John Ludig's murder was that Napoleon was instantly and overwhelmingly remorseful. They had to keep the guns from him to keep him from committing suicide on their drive home to Grapeland. It was an impulsive act, one I regretted instantly, he said in a later interview. I thought I was grown then, but I had adolescent ways. <laughs> 